With the 50th anniversary of Apollo 12 approaching, I decided it was high time to highlight the career of the mission's commander, Charles Conrad Jr., who went by Pete Conrad. Conrad's motto was, if you can't be good, be colorful, and by all accounts, he was both. Born in Philadelphia on June 2, 1930, Conrad struggled in school due to dyslexia. After failing his exams in the 11th grade, he was expelled from school. His mother believed in him, though, and found an alternative school that taught in a way more suited to him. He did so well with the change in learning style that he got into Princeton, making his way with a Navy ROTC scholarship. Conrad always showed a rich mix of infectious personality and sharp engineering talent, repairing planes and getting his pilot certificate before he graduated high school. In the Navy, he was a flight instructor at the Navy's test pilot school and ultimately instructed his Apollo 12 crew member, Al Bean. His capability was so undeniable that he was invited into the selection process for NASA's first astronaut group, the Mercury 7. Here though, his colorful side got the best of him. He felt that the tests were absurd and unnecessary, and made a point about it. During the psychiatric exam's inkblot test, he described some inappropriate things, and in response to a blank card replied that it was upside down. He also gave the medical staff plenty of trouble, complaining about the proctologist's roughness, and presenting a stool sample in a box with a bow. He was rejected, and one thing he was especially incensed about was the note, not suitable for long duration flight. When he got in on his second try, he was especially interested in proving that statement wrong. Ultimately, Alan Shepard, America's first man in space and also a Navy pilot familiar with Conrad's work, convinced Conrad to try again, and this time the tests were not as ridiculous. Conrad became part of the New Nine, a group that fellow astronaut Michael Collins regarded as the most talented astronaut group. Alongside Pete were Neil Armstrong, Frank Borman, Jim Lovell, James McDivitt, Elliot C., Tom Stafford, Ed White, and John Young. Even in that company, sharp dresser Conrad managed to find a way to stand out. Al Shepard was the head of the astronaut office after being grounded, so Conrad had no trouble lining up his first mission, Gemini 5. He would launch with Mercury veteran Gordon Cooper as his commander on August 21, 1965. The backups for the mission were Neil Armstrong and Elliot C. The goal of the mission was very much to Conrad's liking. It would spend eight days in orbit, which would not only beat the existing record of four days set by Gemini 4, but would also exceed the duration of all NASA crewed missions up to that point combined. Conrad and Cooper put up with malfunctioning thruster blocks and fuel cells while testing rendezvous procedures. The successful mission reassured the medical types that astronauts could survive in space for a duration necessary to get to the moon and back, Paul 11 would be roughly eight days, The later missions were longer. Gemini 5 was also the first NASA mission to have a mission patch, at the insistence of Gordo Cooper, who designed it. Conrad then paired up with his old Navy roommate from the USS Ranger, Dick Gordon, and they would work together through Gemini 11 and Apollo 12. When Conrad went for his second astronaut selection attempt, Gordon had joined him, but didn't get in. Like Conrad though, he tried again and made it on his second try. They were the backups for Neil Armstrong's first mission, Gemini 8. Gordon noted that he and Pete thought alike and trusted each other completely. Infamous launch pad leader Gunter Wendt called them swashbuckling wisecrackers. They had a talent for reducing stress with humor, and so developed a reputation for being able to work hard and party hard. Conrad and Gordon also got along well with others, putting people around them at ease. Michael Collins, who entered the astronaut corps in the same group as Dick Gordon, described Pete as, quote, funny, noisy, colorful, cool, competent, snazzy dresser, race car driver, one of the few who lives up to the image, should play Pete Conrad in a Pete Conrad movie. Of Dick Gordon, he said, quote, Lots of balance, lots of common sense, one of the easiest to get along with, likes to party, but never at the expense of getting next day's job done. Speaking much later to interviewer Catherine Harwood, Gordon said, Were we better than anybody else? Sure we were. We didn't say it. We didn't have to say it. For Gemini 11, Conrad and Gordon were the prime crew while Neil Armstrong and Bill Anders were the backups. The mission launched on September 12, 1966, and Conrad convinced mission planners to let them try for an altitude record, 850 miles or 1,370 kilometers. Of course, this record would soon be greatly surpassed by the Apollo missions, but Conrad liked to set records, and he had a talent for getting his way. The main goal of the mission was to rendezvous with an Agena target vehicle on the first orbit, the first ever direct rendezvous, and then conduct two spacewalks. The rendezvous went as planned, but the main EVA, the first spacewalk, proved a struggle for Gordon. That was no fault of his own. 
the EVA attempts during Gemini 9 and 10 had fared about the same. The problem was with the method of training, which would be fixed for Gemini 12. The second EVA was just a stand-up one in which he took photographs of the Earth and the stars, and that went well. They also attempted to generate artificial gravity by rotation using a tether between their Gemini spacecraft and the Agena, but that was mostly unsuccessful. A final goal of the mission was to have the computer completely control the re-entry accurately, and that turned out fine with the spacecraft splashing down a mile and a half, about 2.4 kilometers, from its target. It was time to move on to the Apollo program, but Apollo had crews of three, so while Conrad and Gordon would stick together, they needed a lunar module pilot. Conrad had been Al Bean's flight instructor in the Navy test pilot school, and Al Bean had entered the astronaut corps alongside Dick Gordon in the third group. Bean was well known for his attention to detail, a fact that would serve the crew well during the Apollo 12 launch. Mike Collins said of him, quote, pleasant, persistent, relentless pursuit of required information, give him an office boy's desk, and within a week he will know what the president of the company does, very pleasant fellow to be around, especially if he likes spaghetti, which is all he eats on the trip. Bean didn't really stand out or put himself forward though, so he hadn't gotten a spot on a crew so far. Conrad tried to give him advice on this, but it didn't pan out, and Bean got assigned to the Apollo Applications Program to work on what would eventually become Skylab. Pete had a strong sense of who he would work well with though, and when it came time to find a third person for the Apollo crew, at first the backup crew for Apollo 9 and ultimately the prime crew for Apollo 12, he told Deke Slayton, the director of flight crew operations, that he wanted Al Bean. Slayton turned him down because Bean was working on the applications program and assigned C.C. Williams to the crew instead. Bean and Williams had been the backup crew for Gemini 10, so he was basically in the same part of Slayton's infamous rotation. On October 5th, 1967 though, Williams tragically died when the T-38 he was flying suffered an aileron control failure. He had ejected, but was going too fast and too low at the time for the ejection to save him. After the death of C.C. Williams, Conrad once again insisted on getting Al Bean on his crew, and this time Deke Slayton relented. And thus, the crew of Apollo 12 was born. It was not at that point a guarantee that Apollo 11 would make the first moon landing. Armstrong himself gave his mission a 50-50 chance of landing, though those odds got higher as they got closer to the mission, but Apollo 12 had much better odds. If something didn't quite work out on Apollo 11, Pete Conrad would have been the first person to set foot on the moon. As it turned out, Apollo 11 was successful, though not without its tense moments. The Apollo 12 crew was not the least bit perturbed, though, because they aimed to do it better. Not only would Conrad be tasked to land the lunar module on the moon, contrary to title, the lunar module pilot didn't actually pilot the lunar module, the commander did, but he would have to land it precisely so that he and Al Bean could visit Surveyor 3, a lunar probe that had landed two and a half years before. Admittedly, most of the work would actually be done by the computer, and corrections made to it meant that it didn't end up astray as it had on Apollo 11, where Armstrong had to take manual control early. Conrad only took control for the last bit, as planned. They had to land close enough to make the walk doable, but far enough away that their landing wouldn't damage the probe. The target area was dubbed Pete's parking lot. During the launch of Apollo 12 on its mighty Saturn V rocket, though, things did not go as expected. There were storms in the area, but the situation didn't violate mission rules, and the launch proceeded. About 36 seconds into the launch, lightning struck the Saturn V, using its plume to discharge to the ground. Then a second lightning strike occurred 16 seconds after that. This knocked out the command module systems because the fuel cells were taken offline, and most of the crew's instruments, all except those operating on battery, were out as well. The crew had no idea what exactly had gone wrong or whether they should abort. Conrad, hand on the abort control, chose not to immediately trigger it, and instead tried to explain the situation to the ground. It turned out that the rocket and its computer were fine, keeping them on their proper course. Far from being panicked, Conrad sounded amused during his calls to the ground. Back at Houston, John Aaron, the Electrical, Environmental, and Consumables Manager, ECOM for short, recognized the failure as a power malfunction and relayed through capsule communicator Gerald Carr that the crew should try SCE to AUX, that is, switch the spacecraft's signal conditioning electronic system to the auxiliary power supply. Neither the flight director, Capcom, nor Commander Conrad knew about this switch, but Al Bean, with his attention to detail, knew the switches he was responsible for and remembered it from training. Flipping the switch allowed Bean to start getting the fuel cells back online. 
After checking the spacecraft out during their first orbit around the Earth, the crew was able to verify that everything seemed to be in order, and they would proceed with the transfer to the moon on the second orbit. As it would turn out, not every instrument was working perfectly. Certain clocks caused trouble and the crew had to get the ground to update them on their fuel situation because those gauges were problematic, but the crew worked around the remaining problems. Mission Control was a bit worried that the lightning had already triggered the parachute compartment's explosive bolts, but there was nothing to be done if that was the case, and they decided not to worry the crew about it. As it turned out, the parachutes were alright. After reaching the moon, Pete Conrad and Al Bean went into the lunar module and left Dick Gordon in charge of the command and service module. The automated phase of the landing brought the LEM a little bit closer to the Surveyor 3 probe than planned, but not so much that it did damage. It blew some dust surveyors away, but ultimately blew more dust off the probe than it deposited on it. During the course of the mission, the public affairs officers got infected by the jovial vibe of the crew and occasionally struck amusing notes of their own. For instance, during the preparation for the first moonwalk, this little bit occurred. Drink. Okay, let's do that. Pass the gunner in and we'll shut off the descent H2O. That's a Pete Conrad laugh. There's some speculation that Conrad had laughed because one of them had gotten splashed by the water gun they were taking a drink from while putting on their suits. On the way back from the moon, when the crew had got a lot of downtime, another PAO offered this bit of deadpan humor. We've not been in contact uh, with the Apollo 12 spacecraft uh, for some several minutes. Uh, the Apollo 12 crew now uh, making preparations uh, for uh, cislunar navigation tasks. However, our earlier contact with uh, Pete Conrad and Al Bean, uh, specifically, they've sounded uh, fresh and chipper. Each reported approximately uh, 12 hours of sleep, giving a combined total of 36 hours, uh, probably some kind of record for sleep in space flight. When Pete Conrad took his first step on the moon, he said, Man, that may have been a small one for Neil, but that's a long one for me. Man, that may have been a small one for Neil, but that's a long one for me. Those words have been the product of a $500 bet with journalist Oriana Falacci, who had expressed doubt that Neil Armstrong was allowed by NASA to say what he wanted when he set foot on the moon. Conrad said he would say that phrase, and he did, but never collected on the bet. Nothing ever goes perfectly though. While the astronauts took a lot of photos of their two EVAs on the moon, the TV camera's tube blew when it was accidentally pointed directly at the sun during the cumbersome setup process. This was a particular shame because unlike Apollo 11's exterior camera, this was a color camera. While this mission would obviously be overshadowed by Apollo 11, the lack of the TV coverage has further diminished its standing in the popular memory. While they diligently went about the mission objectives, including setting up experiments and collecting rocks, Conrad and Bean also discovered a little prank played by the all-Air Force backup crew. The lunar checklists attached to their wrists included photos of Playboy Playmates. Conrad's checklist also included some geological terminology as a joke so that he could sound like a scientist while examining the lunar rocks. That was not a serious attempt to make the astronauts sound competent in geology contrary to some accounts, uh, later astronauts, including the backup crew who would fly on Apollo 15, were already taking geology classes so that they could science the rocks properly. The main focus of this mission was on the precision landing. Al Bean had a prank of his own prepared. He had brought a camera self-timer so that he could capture himself, Conrad, and the Surveyor 3 probe in a photo, leaving people befuddled about who took the photo. Unfortunately, he misplaced a timer, though perhaps that was fortunate since moon hoaxers are apparently unable to apply Occam's razor effectively or appreciate humor. The crew returned without incident, and at this point the swashbuckling duo of Conrad and Gordon decided to take different paths. Dick Gordon wanted a chance to set foot on the moon himself and continued in the Apollo program as the Apollo 15 backup commander. He would have been the commander for Apollo 18, but that mission got cancelled, so unfortunately he didn't get his moonwalk. Conrad and Bean went on to the Skylab program, which Bean had been working on prior to joining the Apollo crew. 
For Conrad, being able to do a long stay on a space station struck him as important for reasons I will let him describe. Well, Skylab is the name given to an older program that we had called Apollo Applications, and we have attempted to take Apollo hardware and make a prototype space station with it. And in doing so, we took uh, the third stage of a Saturn V, and we've made it into an orbiting laboratory, and we had to add on top of that uh, some other equipment. We had to put a structure that we could dock with, and we needed to go outside because we were going to have a solar telescope on it, and we needed to go outside to the solar telescope to take the film out and load the cameras again. This whole total vehicle has been called Skylab, and it's really the United States' first attempt at a orbiting space station and we hope to gain knowledge from it that tells us one that man can live for extended periods of time in space and while he's doing that or proving that we have this solar telescope which will be able to view the sun in uh, an area uh, with the instruments that you can't do it from the ground because uh, the atmosphere filters out these various wavelengths that they would like to study the sun with and then our third major thing are our Earth Resources Experiments, where we're going to observe the ground with a multitude of instruments that will help the hydrologist, the agriculturalist, and the forestry man, and, uh, and a great deal of other people that are interested in natural resources. Then along with that, those three major objectives, we have about 50 cholerary experiments on board. Uh, some of which are more sophisticated experiments of the type that we ran in Gemini. Uh, we're still trying to learn a great deal about our Earth and its atmosphere, so we're going to do UV photography of the upper atmosphere. We're trying to determine exactly the mechanism that happens in the upper atmosphere. We're going to do UV photography on the stars, and we did a great deal of that in Gemini. And uh, by doing this, uh, the type instruments that we are using, uh, we are able to integrate man into, uh, into uh, making real-time decisions on exactly how to take the, uh, uh, the pictures and so forth of the star fields. Of course, uh, these again are pictures that could not be taken on Earth because the atmosphere filters out the UV. We have a maneuvering unit on board. We need to find out uh, just how well man can fly around with a little maneuvering unit and our vehicle's big enough to do it inside rather than venture outside for the first time. These things have applications for future space stations, uh, such as the kind of space station you could build with the shuttle. Uh, Along with those experiments, of course, uh, we are engineering-wise looking at the habitability of this space station and how well we adapt to it and how we would design it better uh, for a permanent space station. And that pretty well sums up Skylab. Of course, regaining the record for the longest mission in space, which had been taken from him by Gemini 7 and then subsequently been taken by the Soviet Union with Soyuz 9, would be a bonus. The first Skylab mission would take the record back and once again prove the psychiatric evaluation from his first astronaut application wrong. He became the commander for the first Skylab crew, and Al Bean was commander for the second, which would stay for double the time. The plan was to launch the station on a Saturn V and then launch an Apollo spacecraft on a Saturn 1B shortly afterward to meet up with it. During the Saturn V launch on May 14, 1973 though, the station was damaged when a micrometeorite shield came loose and damaged one of the two main solar panels. In an even worse stroke of luck, a cable wrapped around the station and obstructed the other main panel, preventing it from deploying. The station was an expensive project and looked to be in jeopardy. It was steadily overheating without the required power and because of the area that was exposed by the panel that had separated, and it was using a lot of onboard propellant to stay oriented so that it wouldn't get to the point where experiments would be damaged and the stored food inedible. In a matter of weeks, it would be a lost cause. Fortunately, the first crew of Pete Conrad, Joe Kerwin, and Paul Weitz had been expected to launch quickly. In the 11 days between the station launch and their launch though, they had to train to conduct the station repairs as the workforce of NASA came up with a way to put a parasol over the part of the station no longer covered by the micrometeorite shield. At this point, NASA didn't really know why the second panel hadn't deployed, so the crew would have to assess the situation on the fly. In fact, this became a pivotal mission because not only would the crew really have to prove that astronauts could do constructive work in space, but they were going into an uncertain situation that would take some improvisation. 
Skylab hadn't really been built with the ability to repair it in mind, so there weren't handholds or foot restraints in the locations where the crew would need them. The crew launched on May 25, 1973, and after making the rendezvous, Conrad piloted the Apollo spacecraft around the station to assess the damage. While Mission Control digested the new information and decided on a course of action, he brought it in for a soft docking and the crew got a meal in. They were instructed to fly near the obstructed solar panel so that Paul Weitz could do a stand-up EVA, one where they would depressurize the spacecraft and his lower body would stay inside the spacecraft for leverage while Joe Kerwin held on to his legs. Weitz would try to use a 10-foot pole with a hook at the end of it as a tool to do the job while Conrad held the spacecraft steady at the controls. This proved incredibly dangerous, as Weitz's attempts actually imparted acceleration to the station, rocked the spacecraft itself, and Conrad had to maneuver to prevent the collision while the station itself was puffing its thrusters, trying to restore stability. Conrad also had a part of his field of view blocked by the hatch, and famously cursed a lot during the ordeal. They abandoned that attempt and tried to get a hard dock with the station, but the capture latches didn't work, and remained stubborn through the backup procedures. They were down to one procedure left in the book, titled Final Docking Attempt, which had never been used, and what they had to do was depressurize again, remove the docking tunnel hatch, alter the docking probe, put the hatch back on, repressurize, and then try one last time to dock. This time, it worked, and they were able to get into the station. They slept in the Apollo spacecraft for the time being, though, because it had been a long day, and the situation inside the station was not necessarily safe. The estimated temperature inside Skylab prior to mission launch was 160 degrees Fahrenheit, or about 71 degrees Celsius. And while the crew reported it felt like about 100 degrees, Houston said it was actually about 125. They went in and used a small airlock meant for experiments to deploy the parasol that would shade the side that had taken damage and expose the insulation. Houston estimated that the temperature would be below 100 degrees, or 38 Celsius, by the next day. Between the Apollo spacecraft and the bulk of the station was a multiple docking adapter with airlocks at both ends, and it was fairly cold, so the crew took refuge there whenever they were getting too hot. The crew took a few days sorting things out inside the station and getting things more habitable. The station's telescope mount had independent solar panels that could provide power, but not as much as the station needed. Two weeks into their stay, Conrad and Kerwin finally went out on EVA to try to get the one remaining main panel unstuck. They had to do the job precariously and without adequate anchors, so when they finally jostled the panel loose to get it to deploy, they were both flung off the station by the force. Their safety tethers held strong though, and they clawed their way back. They were finally able to perform experiments and do all the work that was supposed to be done on the mission. Skylab was saved and left in good condition for the next crew. P. Conrad at the end of the mission, which concluded his NASA career, set a new record for overall time in space. He was not entirely done with space endeavors though. After a brief stint as vice president in a telecom company where he worked on a cable TV system that would eventually become of Time Warner Cable, he joined McDonnell Douglas and worked on the Delta Clipper single stage to orbit program. The one third stage test bed was known as the DCX and it was basically like SpaceX's Grasshopper with the exception that had manual remote controls. For most of the nine tests, Conrad himself was at those controls. Ultimately, the program was taken over reluctantly by NASA when the original strategic defense funding ran out, and NASA didn't really put much effort into it. Eventually, some DCX engineers worked on Blue Origin's new Shepard system, which was clearly inspired by the DCX. Pete Conrad died on July 8, 1999 from a motorcycle accident at the age of 69. In the book In the Shadow of the Moon by Francis French and Colin Burgess, one of the authors notes that they met with Conrad only a week and a half before his death, and he was, quote, as busy as ever with the space business. While discussing his space achievements, he constantly checked his cell phone following a satellite that his company had a stake in. He expressed annoyance that, while it had been possible to fly commercially 40 years after the Wright brothers flew, the same opportunity in space was still not possible 40 years after NASA was formed. In his opinion, the last 30 years had been wasted time and he was eager to push the boundaries once again. Unlike John Glenn, who let NASA fly him into space in his 70s, Conrad was eager to fly again, but in his own spacecraft. In the following clip, Al Bean recalls being asked to speak at Conrad's funeral. It was a big shock to everyone, 
and uh, we uh, I missed him every day since then. Incidentally, I think about him a lot. Uh, but the night before the ceremony there at uh, Johnson Space Center, where they plant a tree, a dedicated tree, to any astronaut that's died, uh, I knew I'd have to say a few words. And uh, so the night before, I was thinking about it. Pete's not a uh, morose guy. He's, uh, his motto was, if you can't be good, be colorful. So he was good and colorful, but that was his way of thinking about things. And I said, well, I'm going to talk about him a little bit, but I don't want it to be like uh, you hear at all these things. So uh, the night before, I thought about it quite a bit and I tried to come up with something new. I did come up with a couple of ideas. And uh, then as I was driving to the ceremony with my wife, Leslie, I was talking about it, rehearsing it, and she made a couple of excellent suggestions about it. And so we get there, and uh, several people, astronauts, uh, George Abbey, who was our boss, saying talk a, a little bit, introduced me. And then I got up there, and I uh, stood there a few minutes, and I said, Last night, when I was thinking about this, after I dropped off to sleep, uh, I woke up in the middle of the night and Pete Conrad was at the end of my bed. And he said, don't worry about it, Al. When you get there tomorrow, I'll help you out. So I said, then let's uh, have some silence now and uh, I'll uh, see what Pete has to say. So. We were all quiet, and I was looking up uh, towards the heavens, and uh, all of a sudden I started talking, oh, okay, Pete, thank you for coming. I didn't know exactly what to say, and then Pete tells me some things to say, and then I say them, you know. Of course, the audience is completely uh, shocked and blown away by this, because this isn't astronaut talk. This isn't the way official NASA functions go, see. But being an artist, they can't fire me anymore. And so I could do what I thought Pete would like. And so then I say, okay, I'll do that. And uh, I'll tell George Abbey that. Then I turned around and I said, George, Pete wants to say something to you through me. And then I looked up again and I said, now look, Pete says, George, that he was the smallest guy in the office all these years. And he doesn't want to have the smallest tree. And he doesn't want the tree to be the same as anybody else's. And then I went back and listened for Pete, what he had to say. And then I said, George, he wants his tree not to have white lights, but to have colored lights because his motto was, if you can't be good, be colorful. And we all know Pete Conrad was good and colorful. And so I said, thanks Pete for helping me out today. This is great. And that was it. And then I left. And I remember Paul Weitz, who was speaking after me, because he flew with Pete on Skylab. He got up there and the first thing he says, never follow an artist. <laughs> So anyway, it was a great moment, and then George Abbey, uh, as Pete requested, uh, next year had next uh, Christmas when they lit those trees. Well, he, all of them were white except Pete's, and he had multicolors. And I noticed over the years sometimes Pete's tree is colorful lights, and sometimes it's red lights, and anyhow, it's different than all the rest. And that's the story. It's a great memory of Pete a great memory of the kind of astronaut he was. When I was there 18 years, I felt that he was the best astronaut that I had uh, worked with, uh, not because I flew with him, but because he just seemed to be natural at it. He never had hidden agendas. His mind was always being on the best astronaut he could be flying the best mission he could fly, all these things that uh, ideal astronauts are supposed to be, then he was those things. Not every astronaut was that way. 
he he was great and it, he deserves a colorful tree. In addition to being in the shadow of the moon notes that Neil Armstrong said at the funeral, Pete was the best man I ever knew. He treated me like a brother. NASA Administrator Dan Golden said, At 69, he had the spirit of a 13-year-old. And John Glenn said, I didn't know anyone that was filled with more irrepressible enthusiasm and sense of humor and new ideas and general joy of life than Pete. At one point, Conrad had said he wanted his epitaph to be I came, I flew, I left. In the end, under his name, the words on his grave at Arlington Cemetery read just two words, an original. Thank you for watching this astronaut profile of Pete Conrad.